Hello everyone and welcome back to Just Finish Coding. I'm Sriram and this video is part 8 of the color switch series that we're making on Scratch 3. Since you've made it this far, I want to congratulate you because this will be the final video in this series. By the end, you will have fixed all the bugs, added in the ball collisions and created the ending animation. To start with, we can go into the stage and create a new variable. We can call this new player color and this will function as a temporary variable while we're changing the player's color. Now we can get into the obstacle sprite up to the when I receive tech. We can remove the entire score increment as all of this can be done much more efficiently in the star sprite. Okay, now we can move on to the replacement code. Within the if clone is equal to yes, add another if condition. Here we can check if the clone is touching the ball. If it is, then we have to increment the score and then delete the clone. The next thing to do is changing the color of the ball when it hits the color switcher. We can first check if the clone is touching the ball and if it is, then we can set new player color to current player color. Here current player color is a value that could be anything from 1 to 4. Each of those numbers represents the particular costume of the ball. What we need to do here is find a way to change the number to some other number in the same range. There are a few ways of doing this, but we can do it easily with a repeat until. We can simply set new player color to be a random value from 1 to 4 until it is no longer the current player color. Once we're done with this, we can set current player color to new player color and we would have the necessary change. The clone has served its purpose and thus we can delete it. Now we have to use the current player color variable to change the color of the ball. We can create a function to do this called costume change. If current player color is 1, then we can switch the costume to purple. This should be a no-brainer when we look at the costumes of the ball. The first one will be purple, the second pink, the third blue, and the fourth yellow. We just need to put these things within an if-else and the function is complete. To actually get the resulting color changes, we need to use the function within the ball tick. So within the ball engine, we can just add costume change right at the end. Okay, that would be all for the color changes. Now it's time to set up the ball collisions. We can create a new block called check ball collisions and put it right on top of the ball engine definition. Let's now define the block itself. The time when the collision happens is when the ball is touching an obstacle color, which is not its own color. So for example, if the ball is yellow and it touches the obstacle's pink color, then that's a collision. So first we can wrap all this up within an if touching obstacle. We can set up four different touching color blocks so that the remaining code can be set up quite easily. To do this, um, hit the green flag and use the colors from the how to play screen rather than from the thumbnail. So once we're done with all of these uh, colors and uh, we've taken each of them and organized them, we can have an if else statement with the costume number being the condition. In case the costume number is one, then it means that the ball is purple. We can simply check if the ball is touching any of the colors apart from purple. If it is, then we can set player died to yes. The second case will be similar except that the ball is now pink. So we have to check if the ball is any other color than pink. In the third case, the ball is now blue. So we check if it is touching an obstacle, which is either purple, pink or yellow. Finally, in the last case, the ball will be yellow, so we just check for every other color. Okay, so now the player died variable will be a check if the player is still alive or not. To use this, go into the main start game script and change the forever block to a repeat until. If we repeat until player died is yes, then all of the game functions will stop once we collide. This is exactly what we want. After this part is over, we need to make sure that the ball breaking animation occurs. We will use the death particle sprite to do this, so there is no more need for the ball to be shown. After hiding the ball, first broadcast show death clones. It is very important that you use the broadcast in wait instead of broadcast because otherwise there will be major errors. Now it's time for us to set up the actual animation. 
we can set up 20 ticks of a new message which we can call death animation tick. After the main animation is finished, we'd want the ending to fade gently rather than suddenly disappear. So we'd set up another message which um, we can call death particles fade tick. Rather than doing it for 20 times like we did for the previous message, it's enough if we do it 10 times. At this point, the game is already over, so the player will be expecting to get another chance. So what we need to do is create a function to restart the game. Within this, we simply need to do two things. First, we need to broadcast init and wait, and then broadcast start game and wait. These are the very two last messages that we broadcast in the stage. Alright, now let's put the function in place and then go on to code the animation. Within the death particles, we can hide the sprite and uh, the clones when we receive thumbnail. It should be fairly obvious that the animation should show only when the game is over. Within when I receive init, we need to first hide the sprite and delete all of its clones. We can initialize the clone variable and set it to yes when we are creating the clones. We can make a block called init clones and make it run without screen refresh so that all of this happens pretty much instantly. After the block is finished, we need some way of differentiating the clones from the sprite during the animation. So it's important to set clone to no at this point and within init clones we just create 10 clones. When each clone is created, we can set the costume to be a random value from 1 to 4. Even though our costumes are different texts, this will still work in the absence of the name because here Scratch would just choose the costume number instead. But it is just best to clear it up, so head over into the costumes tab and change each of the costume names into their costume numbers. In a nice shattering effect, the shards that will emerge have different sizes. Some of them would be tiny while some of them would be much bigger. So here what we can do is set the size to be a random value from 25 to 90 percent and this should give us a pretty nice variety of sizes. To finish, we need to make sure that the shards fly all around, so we can set the direction to be a random value from negative 180 to positive 180, so it can go anywhere from the sprite. When we receive show death clones, we can first move all the clones into the ball and then show them. This should be obvious and now we can move on to the next message. When we receive death animation tick, all we'd want the clones to do are move about the screen. Since the directions have already been randomized, just a move 10 steps block will be enough. We don't want the clones to get stuck at the edges, so add an if on edge bounce. Finally, for the death particles fade tick, we can keep all of the death animation tick code, but in the end add a change ghost effect by 10. The ghost effect keeps increasing the transparency and when it is set to 0, the clone is opaque, and when it is set to 100, the clone is fully transparent. When we change it by 10 and have this done in 10 ticks, the resultant clone will be completely invisible in the end, having a ghost value of 100. Okay, so that's the main part and to finish off the game, we just need to tie up a few loose ends. At the beginning of our game, there will be no obstacle clones and the score will be zero. In case we only create the obstacles when the score is equal to the number of obstacles minus two, then there will be no clones created because zero is not equal to minus two. To fix this, we need to do this even when the score is greater than number of obstacles minus two. So that's going to be the first bug. The second bug would occur when the level variable is empty and the computer is unsure of what obstacle clone to form. To fix this, we can go to the stage and add a message broadcast right before init. We can call this check level generator. Now we can go back to the obstacle sprite and add a when I receive check level generator. Here we simply check if the length of the level is zero, which means the level is empty, and if it is, we generate level text. To make sure this works, set both level and level rotation to blank and hit those two blocks in isolation. This should erase everything that exists in them since they're cloud variables and make sure that this particular debugging works. The final problem that the user can have is if he moves the how to screen by accident. This is the easiest fix because all we have to do here is add a go to x0, y0. And that is going to be everything needed for the game to work. If we test the code now, we should have a fully functional color switch game.
If you've enjoyed this game series, then make sure you click on the playlist on your screen right here, as that will take you to a brand new game segment. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next series. Bye.